Hello, my name is uh, David Kerr. I'm Director of Communications here at the Diocese of Lansing, which is in uh, Michigan, for those who don't know. And um, for anybody who reads the life of Jesus Christ, they'll know that the stories of the Gospel are suffused with tales of uh, healing, uh, the sick, the lame, the blind, the dead. That as we move into the uh, early uh, church, and uh, as recounted in the New Testament, such miracles occur again. And even throughout the history of the church, one only has to think of St. Philip Neri, the great saint of Rome in the 16th century, whose biography uh, recounts that he raised the dead on more than one occasion. <laughs> um, but do such things still happen today? Probably guess the answer we're going to give to that. Um, but uh, uh, certainly in recent years, uh, the church has seen, and the church in this part of the world has seen the emergence of new forms or new ways or new organisations committed to a healing ministry. And uh, this week has seen the Diocese of Lansing and Bishop Earl Boye uh, of the Diocese of Lansing post up on the diocesan website uh, approval for four such organisations. Uh, the statement uh, reads, which you can read on the website, and we'll post a link to that uh, um, wherever this podcast uh, emerges. Uh, following investigation, says Bishop Boyer, following investigation, study and discussion, I find these ministries are committed to operate in harmony with the teaching of the church in faith and morals with particular reference to the redemptive nature of suffering and the centrality of the sacramental economy. And the four organisations referred to are the John Paul II Healing Centre, Live Free Ministry, St Paul Evangelisation Institute, and Encounter Ministries. And I'm very delighted to say that we have the president of, uh, Mr. President, uh, we have the president <laughs> of Encounter Ministries uh, with us here today, Father Matthias Thalen, who's also a priest of the Diocese of Lansing and the pastor of uh, St. Patrick's in Brighton. Great to have you here. It's great to be here. How are you doing? Not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, just tell us, uh, we'll move on to Healing Ministries uh, any minute now, but uh, how uh, uh, what was the process of developing this statement of approval from uh, the bishop, and how welcome is it? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the bishop has been very open to the work of the Holy Spirit in so many ways, and has has, has allowed a lot of people to really just to press in and to pray to uh, to pray for God to do what He wants to do, right? And so, as people are experiencing healing, as people are are seeing that these ministries are really helping people, and as these ministries become more popular, the bishop is like, well, let's let's answer some of these questions that people are asking because every any time that uh, someone presses in for asking God for a particular grace, there's always going there are always there there are there is always going to be a set of questions that people are asking that need to be answered. And so, Bishop, uh, what he did is he established a little committee, and the committee was asking some of these questions and then he was talking with them and then he invited us to come in for some conversations and then ultimately he says yeah these are these are approved ministries i mean the bishop didn't need to do this but he did it because he wants there to be clarity as to where he and the diocese stands vis-a-vis -vis the ministry of healing and the ministry of just helping people be set free so i guess the the most obvious first question which i didn't ask first <laughs> is uh, what is a healing ministry I mean, it's it's a ministry ultimately of of the gospel. I mean, one of the things that um, that we're convinced of in, in encounter ministries, but a lot of more people are being convinced of, is that ultimately all of redemption can be seen in terms of healing. Jesus has come to heal the wound of sin and death in the human race. And he does so by reconciling us to the Father. So in Jesus' ministry, as he's declaring the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the reign of his love, he's peeling back the curse of death and sickness uh, and sin that was on humanity. And so when he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he brings the kingdom to bear on those people's lives in such a way that they know that that he is the son of God and they're called to, re to repent and to believe in the gospel. So healing ministry is ultimately a recovery of the, the dimension of, of healing in the preaching of the gospel. So preaching the kingdom of God and then demonstrating that kingdom. So preaching about God's goodness and his love and his salvation and redemption and then praying for the sick so that as some people are healed, that serves as a sign of the truth of what we're proclaiming. But when you say recovered is this what's is this something new or something that's been re-established in the life of the church um i mean is there is there a to use the the, 
the, the rats in Yerian, Pope Benedict phrase, but is there, a, is, there a con, is there a hermeneutic of continuity to healing ministry across the 2,000 years? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, the, the word rediscovery, I think, is a more appropriate word. John Paul II used that term regarding the charisms in the church, a rediscovery of the charismatic dimension of the church. Um, but I would say that in the early church, healing was a lot more common. We see it in the Acts of the Apostles. We see it in the writings of Paul. We see it in the early church with the church fathers, where ordinary Christians would, would pray for healing and God would would heal people. People were raised from the dead. And so it was a lot more common in the early church and it has always been present in the church in one way or another throughout the history. There hasn't ever been an age where people aren't experiencing healing. The difficulty or the difference was is it was more an exception and it wasn't really kind of something that happened more often. And it often happened in the lives of the saints and it didn't happen as much in, in ordinary people's lives. But Throughout the church's history, where there was very intense missionary activity, these were things that would happen on a, on a somewhat regular basis. And so it, a rediscovery in terms of, of us rediscovering that God wants to do this today and that God is doing this today, and specifically because the church needs it today. Uh, we're in a very, very difficult spiritual landscape um, regarding postmodernism, secularism, a kind of a more uh, resistant culture to the gospel. And, and healing can just be an incredible sign of God's presence. And when we say healing, are we talking physical healing, spiritual he healing, or what? So spiritual healing ultimately is the reconciliation that we have with God. I mean, the, everyone can say that God calls, God comes to forgive our sins in Jesus, and he's come to reconcile us with the Father. Um, we're talking, um, w the healing ministries that you mentioned are more focused on spiritual, I'm sorry, emotional healing, right, and physical healing. Right, so when you're preaching the gospel and you pray for someone um, who maybe have some, some issues with some emotions, right? That maybe they have difficult trauma in, the, in their past or maybe some difficulty, they believe some sort of lie. Well, some of these ministries are bringing restoration and healing and wholeness to the human heart, to their emotions so they can better say yes to the gospel uh, and to, yes to living out the gospel. Um, but we're also talking, also talking about physical healing, uh, to praying for physical healing um, in the context of preaching the gospel or in the context of ministry and, and God's healing people. So to ask the question, I'm sure you can ask then at any dinner party, what have you seen with your own eyes in terms of spiritual healings and physical healings as you've um, gone about your encounter at ministry? Well, I mean, how much time do you have, right? I mean, so spiritual healing, uh, ultimately, it's, it's the sacrament of reconciliation. It's me as a priest, of seeing people reconciled with God. It's one of the most powerful experiences that I have as a priest. And I, I love seeing that God forgiving a sinner and a sinner coming to know his uh, invincible and un, uh, unfathomable love. And uh, so that's, that's one thing. Um, emotional healing, one of the, I think, I always tell people this, people sometimes will know about encounter because of physical healing, but I think emotional healing is even more important than physical healing in the sense that you can have someone experience a healing right in their body, but them, because of their emotional bondage or their spiritual bondage turn away from Jesus. And I'll never forget, there was a woman that came into my office. She was getting um, prepped for marriage um, and uh, she, had, she had an issue where she couldn't have any children. She was very sad about it. And because I brought up children, do you guys want children? And she, they were like, I can't because I have cancer and I have to remove um, parts of my reproductive system. I just, I can't have children um, because I have this big tumor. And, um, and I said, well, can we pray? And she's like, yeah, that's fine. I said, let's just pray because I think God, God could heal this. So we prayed probably, probably a, like a two or three minute prayer and she felt all this power come over her and in her at that place. And she's like, I don't know what this is. And I said, well, you know, what? it could be God healing you. I'm not sure, but keep me posted. I'll never forget the voicemail I received from her. Her basically screaming slash crying on the phone, she'd just gotten back from the U of M uh, radiology department and they did a scan and there's nothing there anymore. It was completely gone. And she has all of these children today, right? But one of the things that strikes me is that um, I had heard from a friend, this is like a year after, that she wasn't even practicing her faith. So some of us might think, well, wh wait a second, God did that for you? Why wouldn't you practice your faith? I have no idea. But what I can tell you is that sometimes the enemy lies to us and the enemy who uses our past and maybe the, some of the uh, lack of spiritual healing might have been an issue. 
So physical healings are signs of his presence. And I'll never forget, there was also a, a, a moment at a healing service last year, there was a Jewish woman that was healed in front of about 900 to 1,000 people. Didn't even believe in Jesus. The healed power of, healed of She had an issue with her wrist that was extremely painful. She was going to physical therapy poor. Ther therapy for and she feels the power of God come on her during the service and she's weeping because she doesn't even believe in Jesus she comes forward and she starts doing something that she could not do without extreme pain without any pain her doctor ends up ends up verifying that there's no reason why she needs to keep coming back the story ends up going going out to the whole community but my favorite part was when she came up to testify she didn't believe that Jesus was real and my friend said well, what do you think of Jesus now and she was utterly speechless. She didn't expect him to break into her life, and he did. I could have talked with her for 10 hours about the reality of Jesus as the Messiah, because she was Jewish, but she met the Messiah in that way and it opened her heart to the reality that Jesus might be who he says he is. So that's the, the power of signs and the power of healing that happened in Jesus' own ministry. And how does this, in practical terms, how does this uh, tend to display itself, manifest itself? work i mean is it is it the laying on of hands is it praying over people is you know if, if somebody met with you and 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 you were praying for their healing what would what would occur i mean essentially it's a it's an invitation to allow one brother in christ or a sister in christ to intercede to the father on that person's behalf and as the person may be laying on their hands if they want um that was certainly what jesus said in the gospel in mark 16 that lay, they would lay their, those who, who believe, um, those who believe in me will lay their hands on, and the sick will recover, right? So it's, it's about faith, right? Um, but it's just simply laying on their hands or maybe not and just asking God to, to bring healing and then just testing it out. It's honestly that simple. Now there's, in the model of prayer that some people pray, there's different ways to do that, um, different ways to kind of enter into that, but it's, it's essentially us stepping out in faith and praying for our brother or sister who's sick. And does, do, all the baptized have, uh, keep me right here, the authority, the, the charism, the gift in order to, to perform this healing or is it something particular to only certain people? Yeah, so the answer is both and. Um, and or, or it's both and, right? So in the gospel, there are several places where the only requisite that is uh, for healing for, is, is a believer that believes in Jesus. Right, and there are several passages in John 14, 12, uh, Matthew, or I'm sorry, Mark 16, and there's Luke 9 and 10 where he's sending out the disciples and he's giving them authority. These are ordinary baptized Christians and if you believe, then you will see the things, you will do the works that I do and even greater ones, right? So it's just simple faith. So any Christian can pray for healing and see a result. However, the church has been very clear that some people have, the, have a charism of healing, and a charism is that stable disposition of grace that enables God to do uh, a specific activity with more frequency and more um, efficacy, right? Um, and so, um, so, yeah, some people have a charism. They can do it a lot, just like teaching, right? Everyone can teach. Uh, everyone can, can teach if they put their heart to it, right? And God will be giving grace for that. But some people have a charism of teaching, Everyone can preach the gospel. Some people have a charism. They're especially effective, especially fruitful when they use it because they have a charism for it. It's a very similar thing with, with healing. Now when, uh, in the bishop's brief statement, um, noting approval, or giving approval, he says that, um, that what these healing ministries, including Hampton Ministries, do is in full conformity with the church's understanding of uh, the sacramental economy. And I'd imagine there may be some people listening to this who are thinking, well, you know, if somebody seeks physical healing, the obvious way to do that is through the sacrament of the sick. And so this seems perhaps in opposition to this or un uh, to, to, this, to, to how we understand the sacraments. Um, I, I guess explain to us how these two things sit together, the, the sacraments and, and this form of healing that seems to sit outside or alongside the sacraments. Yeah, I mean, I think we understand the sacrament of the anointing of the sick to be instituted by Christ, given to the clergy, given to the hierarchy, right? And the sacrament of the anointing of the sick was something that we see there's scriptural evidence in, in James chapter 5. When he who is sick, let him call him upon the priests so they can pray over them, anointing them with oil uh, in the name of the Lord, right? So there's a sense in which this is Jesus acting in and through the hierarchy of the church 
in and for the sake of the people and, and their, not just their physical sickness, but their salvation, right? The forgiveness of sins. And the church has, had, has this beautiful theology of, of approaching people toward the end of death. Uh, it used to be called extreme unction, right? The unction in the extremis, right, right before they die, right? Um, and so this is something that the God gives to the church in and through the priests. When it comes to the charism of healing or even just praying for healing, it's, it's a, a renewal of the understanding that God has anointed the entire body to bring healing to the body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, right? And the laity often are given gifts that priests don't have. And it's a very humbling thing for people to admit. Uh, one of the things that's, that's so evident in the renewal of these ministries is lay authority to act in Jesus' name, lay authority to bring blessing into the world. And so the, the charismatic dimension is the dimension of God giving every single person gifts and the hierarchical, hierarchical dimension that God is, is pastoring, it is, he's, he's sanctifying and he's governing the, governing the body through the hierarchy in the sacraments. They're both complementary according to the teaching of the church. And so what I find in, uh, in the renewal of these ministries that you're, you're saying, just a very beautiful invitation of the laity to take, to take part in this ministry because, uh, because it, it's not limited to the sacraments. What's your own story? How did you become aware of, involved in healing ministries such that you're now sitting here as the president of Encounter Ministries? Yeah, so I was at the Institute for Priestly Formation when I heard about God was still healing to people today. I didn't actually, I never heard of that before. And I heard, so what age would you have been um, in that stage? I would have probably, I was in seminary. Okay. I was after, after my third year of seminary, I began to hear a professor talking about how God was still healing people today. And she gave me very many stories. And then she invited us into... Um, I mean, she actually invited me, but I, I, I began to become aware of some of these people that are um, that were bringing healing to people. That's the first time I've ever heard of it. But I, I kind of stepped into this almost by accident. Before that, when I was, I'm sorry, a little bit after that, when I was in seminary, when me and some friends were going downtown Detroit evangelizing on the street before it became cool, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, we were praying, and I'll never forget this this woman who was basically blind, couldn't read anything in front of her except by doing this, um, she was radically healed in the spot. And she started screaming. Like, every, like she's, could, you could not keep her quiet because she was able to read things afterwards and she was going nuts. Uh, and um, I'll never forget that. I, mean, I can go into the whole story, but it, it really had a deep impact on me. And uh, I remember uh, when that happened, I remember asking, I remember actually doubting that it really happened. I remember like, did that, was she making this up? Was she, was she really blind? Was she not? And her, her before and after, not only what she could physically read, because we saw her trying to do this, trying to read before, because we took her to dinner, and then afterwards, both her ability to read things really far away and her screaming and her praising God and her joy just completely wrecked me. And I remember thinking to myself, um, this couldn't have happened because I'm not worthy. And then I realized that, oh, I thought this was about me and my holiness. It's really not about me at all. It's about Jesus loving on this woman. So it really kind of changed my perspective that God not only can do these things today, but if we give him a chance, uh, he wants to. Is there a particular worthiness or sanctity that, that somebody who heals should possess, has to possess? One can think in, 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 uh, in the New Testament of that story of the, the, the disciples being perplexed that they couldn't cast out demons and mm -hmm. Christ says, well, that's, you know, requires prayer and fasting. And, and so something was required on, 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 on their part. Um, w w on your part as the healer, you know, it, it, w what disposition or, or state of life or state of sight do you have to have? One of the things that fascinates me is that Jesus tells his disciples before the resurrection, before Pentecost, in their, in their seminary days, if you may, he tells them to go from town to town proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing the sick. He didn't wait until they were perfect in virtue. He didn't wait until they, were, uh, they had their whole lives together. They were very much, um, and they, they denied him, right? Right as he went to the cross. But they were doing his, his work way before all of their lives were together. And so uh, on the one hand, we say that there's always ways in which we can, we can grow in virtue, grow in holiness, grow in our, uh, a more pure heart as we pray. On the other hand, doing his work doesn't require us to be perfect because he's the one that's doing the work. We just have to cooperate. And so um, 
that was a big, ev- a big obstacle in my mind. How could God ever use me to do anything that extraordinary? Um, because I knew my sinfulness. And then after a while, I realized, oh, this is not about me. This is about him. And we, it's the same thing with the preaching of the gospel. How could God ever use me to preach the gospel, to share good news? I'm such a sinner, this and this. And my, I would say to that person, it's like, stop looking at yourself. This is about Jesus. He loves you. He chooses you precisely in your unworthiness to do this. And so the disposition of the person praying is focus on Jesus. The person who's receiving, focus on Jesus because it's all about Jesus. And that's, it's, it's honestly as simple as that. Now in this uh, document that's been produced by the diocese, there's the statement from the bishop. There's then um, a, a, a link to various resources, the catechism, uh, various statements and such matters by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, um, documents by Pope St. Paul the Sixth and Pope St. John Paul the Second on such matters. And then there's a whole bunch of frequently asked uh, questions. And we won't go through all of them because people can see them. And they're very important, um, so read them. Yeah. So, okay, well, okay, <laughs> no, not you. I'm talking about the people, uh, that, people that are watching. Read them. Let's do this like the CDF. I'll <laughs> test you. No, and so I guess the first question is one that many, I guess, some people, many people, maybe Catholics may have. Um, you know, they could say, well, you know, God... Uh, 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 you know, omnipotent, um, you know, could could save himself the bother by not uh, permitting suffering in the first place. Yep. Why did why does yep. God permit suffering? Why does God permit suffering? Is that what you, is that your question? Well, that's the first question in the Q and A. So it seems like a good place to start. Yes. Um, yeah, well, that's why does God allow suffering? Well, I mean, this is one of the million-dollar questions. I mean, he loves suffering because he wants to bring greater good out of it. I mean, this is precisely the, the question that Christianity and Jesus is, or God's revelation in Jesus is answering, right? Um, God permits suffering, like I said, because he can bring something good out of it, but ultimately, what's the cause of suffering? It's our separation with, from God. And he, he reconciles us in Christ. He unites us in his son Jesus. And by uniting us with him, He's already declared his desire and his intention to rid us of suffering, to, to alleviate suffering, to, to unite us with himself. And so ultimately, um, God's response to suffering is Jesus. And so that's, that's his response. Now, question number five. I feel like I'm on, this is like a quiz or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Marks <laughs> at, you'll get marks out of 10 at the end. You're doing well so far, Father. Well done. Carry on. Um, no. Uh, one of the other questions that I guess people may have is if somebody comes forward to a healing ministry to seek physical healing and yep. they don't receive physical healing, mm-hmm. does that say something about them? Not at all. Not Why? At all. Why? Why? Because Jesus never promised that he was going to bring full restoration of our bodies on this earth. In fact, Jesus was only on earth for how long? 33 years. 33 years, right? Did he heal every single person in that entire region of the earth? No, because he was declaring and proclaiming the kingdom of heaven, right? So as he's pro- declaring the kingdom of heaven, he's inviting people to respond in repentance and faith to have a relationship with him so he can heal everyone in heaven. Now the tension of the gospel is that he's saying to pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's, he tells his disciple to go and pray for the sick, to draw the reality of heaven by their faith into reality so that people know what heaven is like, but he never promised that this was gonna be heaven. In other words, like, part of what I always tell people is that it's, it's, uh, it's God's job to heal, it's our job to pray. We just simply dispose ourselves and we, we're obedient to that command to pray for the sick. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, but we, we really press into his goodness. Because as Consula Mesa says, which I think is a very beautiful thing, beautiful thing he says, it's like God, the preacher to the people. Who yeah, Raniero Consula Mesa. Yeah. He says that God either delivers us from suffering or he delivers us through suffering. That's the power of God. God did not come just simply to say, I'm going to come and solve all of your problems. No, he's like, I'm going to unite myself to you and you may have to suffer with me in and through this, but I'm going to, I'm ultimately victorious. And so that's why as, as someone who uh, prays for the sick and, and all these ministries, we don't have an issue when people aren't necessarily healed because God's still going to deliver them. God is still at work. He still loves them, right? Because the mystery is, is that he invites us to be with him where there is no more suffering, no more wailing, no more pain, no more death. And that's the good news of the gospel. You've discussed um, both physical healing 
and you've touched upon spiritual and emotional healing as well. In terms of the latter, emotional and spiritual healing, what are the wounds that you find most common or most commonly presented in, in, in uh, this moment in history? Well, I'd say um, probably the biggest wound is um, the wound of fatherlessness or, or father wounds in general. Um, and then as a result of that, there's often wounds with regard to, to family of origin and, and mothers as well. Uh, obviously, father wound is a family of origin wound. But, but in general, there's a, a sense of not feeling safe when people were younger, not feeling affirmed and loved, not having the, the environment in which they can kid children can make mistakes and be loved and uh, and to really be valued for who they are not what they do so a lot of people don't understand that the dysfunction that we experience in daily life causes children to form certain sets of beliefs about themselves and their environment uh, and, and all, unfortunately there's a lot of projection onto God because parents are meant to image God to us and so a lot of the wounds emotionally happen when when those things happen um, the other thing that i would say is that sometimes there's a lot of um, verbal physical or sexual abuse as well that cause a lot of uh, deep shame and a leap kind of identity lies and to be honest part of redemption is just bringing those areas of pain to jesus that's what inner healing is about that's what emotional healing is is helping the person recognize that 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 stuff is there and to present that to our healer to our divine physician and allowing him to speak his love and his truth into places where we did not experience love where we did not know his truth he he wants to wash us away from the lies that have been kind of um, that we've, we've been believing so that we can live in his truth and be set free right so inner healing is a very powerful way uh, or this emotional healing is a very powerful way of being set free from the lies and the wounds of the enemy so we can live free in Christ and be filled with his joy uh, I think we'll draw things to a close not least because I know you've got to go back and continue with uh, giving a retreat to the seminarians of uh, Sacred Heart uh, Seminary uh, your alma mater um, but what can people do I guess the, the key uh, concluding question perhaps what can people do if they wish to know um, more about healing ministries I know that the, the John Paul II Healing Centre I think have two days at St Martha's in Okemos just outside Lansing not this weekend but the next weekend next weekend but what can people do if, they, if they're listening to you and they feel I, I want to know more what should they do um go to that event. I mean, the John Paul II Healing Center, the guy that's leading that is uh, Bart Schutz. I don't know if it's on the weekend itself. It might be. I don't know. I think it might be Friday, Saturday. I think it's Friday, Saturday, Saturday okay. yeah. But um, go to that event. I mean, he's, he's a friend of mine, and he's just a very, very articulate, kind of non-threatening guy, and he's a, he's a convert. So he under, and he just understands the tradition. He puts it in a very, uh, very easy to understand, non-threatening way, just helping people understand what's really going on. And it's just very simple too, but he's a, he's a man who has a, he's a heart for God, has a heart for the renewal of the church, and he's just an incredible guy. Or, or you can see Encounter Ministries websites or, um, or St. Paul Street Evangelization or Live Free. Any of those websites can teach about it. Um, but I would suggest as a book by Dr. Mary Healy uh, on healing that if you really want to know more about that, it's one of the best um, single... Um, books that you can find on healing that I find just be remarkable. Well, we'll put all those links on the website and elsewhere, whatever uh, people are consuming this uh, uh, podcast. Uh, not a final question, but a final request. Um, could you just um, bestow, uh, lead us in prayer and bestow a blessing upon ourselves and anybody who's watching or listening? Absolutely. Let's pray. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the gift of your presence. We thank you, Father, for declaring to us in Jesus that you desire to heal us, that you've looked upon us in our brokenness, in our woundedness, in our slavery to sin and death, and you chose to become one of us, to take that sin, that brokenness, and that uh, death upon yourself so that we might live. Lord, out of this gratitude and thanksgiving, we, we beseech your blessing upon all who are watching or listening to this, that you send your Holy Spirit upon them right now from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, that they may know your enduring love. And if you just want to bring healing to them right now, Lord, I, I thank you for your anointing and your peace. And help us always to have deeper faith in you so that when we die, we can be with you forever. 
Through Christ our Lord, amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father Matthias Thielen, President of Encounter Ministries, thank you very much for uh, being with us today, and thank you very much for being with us uh, today, and uh, hope you find the, the podcast useful, that's what it's there for. Uh, so may uh, God bless you, and may they keep you. <laughs>